dealt with you about your sins and about what he could do in changing your home and your life. They danced, the scripture says, but three days later, they were thirsty, there was no water. And the Bible says they began to complain, we found no water. What should we drink? They chided Moses, saying our fathers, and, and Psalms 106 says, our fathers understood not the wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of your blessings and mercies. But they provoked him at the sea, and it says, even at the Red Sea. You know what the, it's like, the Bible is saying? Can you believe this? Can you believe a people who have just seen one of the greatest miracles ever seen by mankind? And, and they just dance and sing and praise the Lord. And three days later, in a, in a test of faith, they fail. And, and they, they are saying, in, in essence, where is our God? Is God with us or isn't he? And beginning to question the very presence of God after this miracle. And they provoked him at the sea, even the Red Sea. When I read that, I said, Lord, how many of us have been delivered? How many of us have been brought to a test of faith? And that's what it was. It was a simple test of faith. That tree was there. God knew what he was going to do. God had an answer. He had a plan. In spite of their continual murmuring, the Lord gave them manna because they began to say, we have no bread. He poured manna from heaven. They said, we want meat. He gave them quails. Quails came three feet high just a mile from the camp. All around them, God just, just swirled a wind in and brought all of this. And the Bible said they ate it till it came out their nostrils. Is God among us or not? Psalms 106.44, they ask, is God among us? Oh, yes, he opened the rock and the waters gushed out. They ran into dry places like a river. See, the Bible says God allowed them to hunger and thirst. Ten times God tested this people on this side of the Jordan River. The Jordan River is the crossing into the promised land. And ten times God said, you provoke me. Over and over again, I'm just trying to find a people who will trust me. I am looking for faith. I'm going to take you into land where you're going to need absolute confidence in me and my word. And I'm going to have to take you through this trial because, friends, and I want you to know this even though you know it. Let me remind you. There is no way that God can produce faith in us except through testings. The only way, there is no other way known to mankind or even the heavens where God can build till he takes you in, the, in, in sometime in a fire or a testing period. That is how it is birthed. That is how it grows from test to test until God sees that he finally has a people who can be a testimony to the world that no matter what happens, and he's always testing us out of love. It's not the wrath of God. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. But God is looking for faith in his people. I don't care if you pray ten hours a day. I don't care if you read this Bible through three times a year. I don't care how much you weep before the Lord. If you don't have faith in your time of trial, if you don't have faith and you begin to uh, fret and worry and murmur and complain and the world looks at you, you've lost your testimony. You've lost your purpose of being. You've lost the very reason why God called you and changed you. We come, they come then to a place called Kadesh. It's this side of the river Jordan. And that, right across they can see the promised land, the place of rest. And there over the hills is Jericho, one of the great walled cities. And because they, they wanted to know what was going to happen over there, they sent 12 spies. Now, I know the Bible says in one scripture, at the command of the Lord. But this, God commanded because he knew they wouldn't go in unless they had their spies. Because God really wanted them to just trust his word. He had already promised them that no enemy could stand against them. He had already promised them, I'll be with you. I'll send hornets to fight the enemy. No weapon formed against you shall prevail against you. I am going to take your battles in my hands and I'm going to take your warfare into my hands. Go, go into the promised land. You know the story. They send 12 spies, spent 40 days in Jericho. 
I mean, in, in the promised land. And they brought back the fruits of the land, loaded with all the fruits and the blessing. And ten of the spies, remember, bring this evil report. They say, yes, it's everything God said it was. It's a wonderful place. It's like heaven. But forget it. Because there are giants there. And there are cities walled up to the heavens. Now, if you want to talk about exaggeration of the devil and his lies, <laughs> up to heaven? And, and those giants, we're like grasshoppers. They're ready to squash us. We are not strong enough. We are not able. We cannot go up. They bring this evil report into the land. God knew that they didn't have faith. Yes, it is a good land, but we are not able, it says. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and they wept all night. See them in their tents, wringing their hands, what do we do now? Has that ever happened in your life recently? After test after test, after miracle after miracle, and everything that God has done, He brought you so far, and now you're facing a test. And they're, they're saying... He brought us out here just to deceive us. We might as well have died. We might as well die right here. Why should we go on? God has deceived us. Can you imagine the unbelief that's in the hearts of these people? And the next day they get up and say, we quit. We can't go up. We don't have the power. We don't have the authority. Joshua and Caleb get up. And, and here's what they said. God said he gave us the land. Do not rebel. Do not be afraid. We're going to win this battle. Their protection has been stolen from them. It's gone. The Lord is among us. He is with us. Let us go on now in the name of the Lord. And, of course, they're ready to stone them. They're stoning the men who bring a good report. They want to stone these men to death. God said, that's enough. That's enough. For ten times I've tested you. And ten times seeking only faith for your protection. Because without faith I can't work. Without faith it's impossible to please God. And I'm looking for a faith that cannot be shaken. That's the only testimony I'll have to the heathen around. It's the only way I can reach... The lost. All the heathen generations around you. Why did I choose you? I chose you for one reason. Just a small people. Just a remnant. And I touched you. And I gave you laws. And I blessed you for one purpose. That you're going to be a testimony to the world. Of what I can do. How I can change hearts. How I can give good laws. How I can guide. And how I can keep people in the hard times. And he said, I've tested you ten times. And every time I've tested, you've broken down. Every time I've tested, you've questioned, where are you, God? And I forgave you. And I ministered to you. I, and if it had not been for the intercession of Moses, God said, I'm going to destroy these people. I'm going to disinherit them. How long before they will believe me? What do I have to do? How many sermons do we have to hear? How many times do we come to this church and sing and shout and talk about faith? How many sermons have been preached from this pulpit about true abiding faith in the time of trouble? I've preached probably hundreds in the last 17 years. Every pastor that's been here preaches that to us. How little that we retain when we're in the struggle. How few Bible verses we, we, we have lost. How, how, how our memory has gone blank when we forget where God met me here and God met me here and God met me here. God delivered here one miracle after another so that you could look back and say, God has never once failed me. God has never once failed anybody within the sound of my voice. He's been faithful. He's been true. And still we provoke him with our unbelief. I will pardon them. Moses interceding, God said, all right, Moses, I'm going to pardon them. These will be a people who are forgiven. I'm, I'm going to give them the manna. 
I'm not going to let them starve. I'm going to take care of them. They'll, they'll be able to exist. But listen to what he says. Not one of these men, he's talking about those who were unbelievers, not one of these men who saw my glory, my miracles, shall see the land. None who doubted, who provoked me, shall go in. Their carcasses will fall in this wilderness. Your children shall wander for 40 years until you waste away. Now, God has to suspend his plan for 38 more years. For the next 38 years, because they'd, they'd been in, there already in a period of time, but the, in, in Deuteronomy it talks about God saying these, thir, th, Moses saying, 38 years. You're going back. God turned them back. Now they tried to go up presumptuously. They said, oh, well, we're sorry. We're going to go up. And they went up and were defeated. And God says, no, I'm not with you. Now, now, if you want to talk about the disaster, the tragedy of unbelief, then you think of a whole generation, 20 years of age and over. Every man, everyone 20 and over, were doomed to live only to die. He said, you're going to go in and your carcasses are all going to go. Folks, we all, we're in the New Testament now. God is not like that. God... God doesn't deal with unbelief that way anymore. Well, that's not what Hebrew says. He said, you be careful lest you enter into the same kind of an evil heart of unbelief. And you don't enter in. That We have that all through Hebrews. He's warning. Don't. This is an example. He said, don't be like them. Look at their life. See what happens to those who allow unbelief to take over their heart. He said, this is, this is nothing to play with. This is the ultimate sin. This is the sin that gives birth to every other sin. This is the mother of all sins. Unbelief. Questioning, where is God in my life? Where is He? There's no evidence. My prayers are not being answered. You are not going in, he says. What he's saying, I can't use you anymore. Because I know if I tested you a hundred times more, you still would never believe me. So uh, there's no end. Uh, you have brought me to the end of my dealings with you. Now you just go and, and you live. You just exist. And God said, I'm going to let you waste away. Folks, I've seen these wasted lives. Everywhere I travel around the world, I see pastors whose lives have been wasted because God spoke to them to be an example of faith before the people. And, and one pastor I know who just gave up, he lost a, a child. A child was killed and, or, or destroyed in, in an early age. And he said, I, how could God do this to me? And that doubt and unbelief just swept into his mind. One pastor who was a missionary in Africa, I told his story once from this pulpit. Went there and, and his, his wife died. She was just a young, precious young lady and she died way out in the middle of a tribal area. A little daughter, and he, he said, that's it. He said, God, if this is the way you treat your children, I can't serve you. He gave his little baby to his friends in Africa. And they said, I, he said, I, I don't want the child. He went back home and died as an alcoholic. You, you see, God means it, saints. God means it. He, he said, this is for your sake. This is not the wrath of God. This is that your unbelief is so set in. Every time I've tested you, you have never once believed that I was going to bring you through. You tried every other way. You, you, you tried to work the phones. You tried to work through people. You, you looked to everybody else. You did everything, but you didn't come to me. You didn't fully trust me in this so that I could build in you a constant faith that nothing could throw you. Now, see, God, they went into the wilderness, and two things are happening in the wilderness now. God is work. You see, he has two generations, those who are 19 and under. God's going to work with this generation because God says, I'm going to take a people in. God is always moving ahead. 
God's not going to stick with some people that are just going to sit, even here in Times Square Church. Thank God for the worship. Thank God for what He's done. Thank Him for altars that have been opened and filled. Thank God for the miracles of conversion we've seen. We've seen how God's provided this majestic theater without a dollar of debt. We've seen God do miracle after miracle. But if we just stay in this place and, 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 and we, we just get comfortable and all we want to do is exist. All we want to do is go on with what we have and be blessed. We don't want to move on into the land. We don't want to, we don't want to go in and, and, and risk what we're going to see on the other side. God says, I, I, I can't work with the people who are so, so set on their own ways. Because you see, when unbelief sets in, you become focused on your own problems. You have no vision. You, you, you don't care about your neighbors. You don't care about a lost world. It's all my pain, my sickness, my problem, my trouble. And churches get into that mode where it's, it's everything is inbred. Everything is self-focused because there's no faith. You see, where there's faith, God says, you get your eyes off of your own problem. You take on my vision. You get to know my heart. And you reach out to others. He said, you seek first my kingdom. I'll take care of you and everything around you, your family, your children, everything else. I'll take care of all that. <clears throat> you see, God has two things going on in the camp. He's going to take the people in, and he has to wait 38 years more while these people all die. Now, I don't, I've figured it up that if, if even 200,000, they say 600,000 men came out, I don't know how many were there. There had to be at least 300,000. But in 38 years, that means there would have to be at least 300 die every day. Can you imagine a death camp? Can you imagine a generation raised up and seeing father, grandfather, and seeing mother, grandmother dying left and right on all sides? It's a death camp. And, and these people, these people are just existing. They're living to die. How sad that we have Christians today just living to die and say, well, this is all there is to it. And, and they don't want to grow. They don't want to risk going out further. Now, if you go to the camp, you're not going to be tested anymore. They weren't tested from that time. Oh, yeah, there, there was serpents came in and all that. But that was not a test. It was just a, an example of God's love and showing the vision of the cross that was to come. Let me give you the background this, he, he's working with this younger generation. I'm sure that Joshua and Caleb were teaching them. Say, we're going to go in. Your generation is going in. They had this word from God, from Moses, Joshua and Caleb, who brought forth a good report and had faith. He said, we're going in. And he trained these. And folks, you look around and see what's happened in churches today. There's nothing but death many places. Just death. Absolute death. There's no moving or stirring of the Holy Spirit. And people are downhearted. You, you look at the conditions around and you see this death. But folks, there's another generation. And we have picked this up everywhere we go. There, you, you, Pastor Carter, sing it right now in Zambia and Africa. There's a new generation rising up with militant faith. There are young pastors who don't want the hype. They don't want the foolishness. They're not into prosperity. They're not into that. They believe God blesses people who humble themselves before the Lord and have a world vision. But they're, they, they're just so Christ-centered and so wanting to know God. Their, their number one pursuit in life is to know Him and to reach the lost. There's a new generation that God is working with right now. God was moving in the camp. And everything you read in those next 38 years, you, you go through... <clears throat> The, the Old Testament, everything that God did in the way of blessing, it was aimed at this 19 and below. <clears throat> now, that means that from the time that God said it's enough, 38 years, you, you had the 40 years, for example, to a 19-year-old boy. And by the time he gets to Jordan, he's uh, what, uh, 59 years old. There were many of them in their 50s. But they had, they had been trained. They were a hidden group of people. And God has a hidden group right now. In this church and in every church and around the world, he's got a hidden group that he's testing and trying. And, and, and those look around and say, I don't want this death. And they're rising up to seek the face of God. And one day God's going to release them in the hardest of times. God's going to release 
this new faith generation. When I talk about a faith generation, I'm not talking about Mercedes. I'm not talking about filling me on. I'm talking about hearts after God that believe Him in all circumstances in their life. <clears throat> now, I brought this background to say this, the key and heart of my message right now. <clears throat> I believe that the church, I believe every one of us, are being brought to the Jordan. And that's a line God has drawn. He said, up to now, yes, you've been tested, but the time has come for you to make a decision. I want from you an ultimate faith. I want something out of you that no matter what happens around you, to you, nothing can shake you. Because I'd rather die than disbelieve. I would rather, I would rather go home than, than to doubt my Heavenly Father. And God is saying, if you are ready to cross over... If you're ready to make a commitment, and folks, you can't do it just on your own strength. I know that. But there comes a time you have to say, Lord Jesus, I want to walk in faith. I'm tired of this up and down. I'm tired of questioning you every time something, every time something comes. We say, well, this is bigger than the last. And we begin to worry and fret. And God says, no, I've drawn a line. And God allowed the spies to go in because I'm going to show you what's going to happen if you want to launch out and step out into this life of faith. If you're going to go that way, you cross over and you begin to pray, you begin to seek. God, I want to be a testimony to the world. I may not be able to go out and be a preacher, evangelist. I'm rather weak at personal evangelism. But, oh, God. When people look at me, I want them to say, there's a man, there's a woman who truly trusts in God. And they are attracted to that in their trouble. They were drawn to that. Where do you get the strength? Where do you get this this hidden power that you have in you? Not to crack up, not to murmur, not to complain when things go wrong and problems come. But God showed them, look, if you're going to step into this life, that, that's, it's, it's not just taking a, a step here and, and uh, saying, I'm going to do it. God says, I want to, I'm going to show you what awaits that kind of a life. I want to show you Jericho. First thing you do, you, you make up your mind and you make a commitment. I am going to trust God. I'm not going to live with these doubts anymore. And you take that step, and you, and the Lord, the first thing He's going to show you a miracle. He's just going to open up your heart, and, and He's going to take you through. The water's opened up. They go through. Of course, as soon as they get there, they're looking at walls. These are those walls they said were up to heaven. God's saying, you know, what you're going to face now is that you're going to have to trust me as you've never trusted me before. I'm going to have to have a people now who are warriors. He said, you saw what happened to the unbelievers. You saw how focused they were on their problems, only their family. And you saw that there was nothing but problems. There was nothing but despair. There was nothing but discouragement. You've seen that. And you don't want that kind of life. But if you're going to come this way, that's not going to be the end. You're going to come to a place that you're going to reach the ultimate test of your faith. And that's when God comes to you and says, faith that I want from you is not something you can produce by just speaking a word. Lord, I believe. I really believe. I truly believe. Lord, I do believe. And you're always trying to jump, start faith, always trying to find something inside that says, I believe. You can't manufacture faith. You can't pump it up. It's a commitment you Make to obey God. What is faith? Faith is obedient to, obedience to the revealed Word of God. It's not a feeling. It's not something you feel. It's something you do. God says, I'm going to give you direction. You remember the captain of the army came and told Josh, take your shoes off. You're not going to lead this battle. You're going to go barefooted. And, and I'm going to take charge. All you have to do is obey me. 
All these people had to do, they were told, they, the word came to them. God says, or most, or Joshua said, you've never been this way before. You've never walked this faith walk before. You, you have failed in the past, but this time, you're going to have to trust the word, not your feelings. You're going to trust the word of God, every word God says. Now, in, you've just come from a life of bread alone. It's all you've had. You've had bread. You've had the manna. But I told you, man shall not live by bread alone. You're crossing that line now. You're going to trust every word in my book. And you're going to live by the word. If it says do it, you do it. If it says don't do it, you don't do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. All they had to do, the Lord told them how to march over, how the ranks came. And when he got there, they weren't marching around that wall trying to pump each other up. They were not saying, oh, God, help my unbelief. They weren't saying anything like that. They were told to shut up. Don't say a word. They were told when to blow the trumpets. They were told where and when to march, how many times. Folks, if you set your heart to obey God, you say, Lord, put your holy fear in my life, the righteous fear of God. And you want to walk in a life of faith and be a testimony to the world then you're going to have to get into this book. And I'm telling you, every man, every woman, every child who makes that commitment, Lord, I will obey your word, that revealed word. You don't have to have an angel. You don't have to have some voice come to you. The Holy Ghost will speak to you, but it will speak through this book. And this is the revealed word of God. And the Lord says, if you want faith, faith comes by hearing it. In the soul, you hear it in the, the heart and mind. He said, that's what I'm looking for, because I'll lead you, I'll guide you every step, I'll tell you what to do, and all God comes to the man, the woman. You may have a, a besetting sin in your life, and if you make a commitment, Lord, I want to obey your word, and you get into this book and you start allowing God to put his righteous fear into your heart. That righteous fear is only for your salvation, only to keep you from wasting away in the wilderness. It's not the wrath of God. It's the salvation of God trying to save us from wasting our lives in some empty, dead wilderness of confusion and fear. God's not looking for one problem at a time, faith. You know, Lord... Just enough faith to get me through. Lord, you get me through this. And then, and then we'll work on it. No, the Lord says, no, I'm asking for a lifetime commitment. I'm asking for an utter commitment to obedience to my word. And if you have that commitment, I will stamp it. I will approve it. And I'll go with you. And I'll give you all the guidance and all the power that you need. I'm going to go with you. Well, that's the man, that's the woman that God walks with. He's made a commitment. I'm going to honor the Word of God. And let me tell you, if I may, uh, where Israel's unbelief burst into a flame. It had only been a spark. You see, when the evil spies come back, they give this, this evil report. And they're devastated now by fear. And they're saying, we're not able to go up. Look at that again. And this, this is something that is at the very heart of what I'm trying to convey this morning. And this is something God's dealing with me about. And, and God has made a powerful impact from what I'm about to say to you now. They don't blame God at first. They blame themselves. And, and what they're saying in their tents all night long we don't have what it takes. We've got powerful enemies, and we have giants against us who are going to tear us apart. And they gave in to their feelings of inadequacy. The feeling that we, we don't have what it takes. We're not going to make it through. And so they turn inward, and right now they're not blaming God. They're blaming themselves. And the Bible says they, they wanted to quit. They turned and began to blame God because this is a dangerous thing. And every Christian here has been guilty of the same thing. When, when, when you go into the prayer closet, and you, for this, this is a season of dryness for you. 
This is a season when everything seems to be going wrong. When you're in this ultimate test, God's about to take you into a new realm of faith. And you go to prayer and say, Lord, I don't have the faith. I, and I, I feel so inadequate. I, I feel so incapable. Lord, I don't seem to be getting it. And so all God hears when you go in the secret closet of prayer, how bad you are. How inadequate you are. I've had the Lord literally chase me out of the prayer closet. I mean, he chased me out. I, I was in the prayer, and I had been sitting there in his presence for an hour, just telling God how bad I felt. And I'm, I'm saying to the Lord, Lord, I don't think my messages are getting through to these pastors. Lord, I feel so empty when I stand before them. And, and Lord, and I, be, I began to tell God, I said, Lord, I... And I looked over my past, and I was telling God almost every bad thing I'd ever done in my life. The feelings, and just expressing these down feelings and this inadequacy, and I'm not worthy, I, I can't do it. Lord, I've preached so much, and I don't remember half of what I preached. And suddenly the Holy Spirit, the Lord spoke to my heart, get up. Get out of here. Lovingly, get out. I'm with you. I love you. I don't want you to remind me of any of your sins that are under my blood. And I told you, you can do anything through Christ who strengthens you. You've been listening to the lies of the devil. Now get your head up and start marching on. That's what we do when we go to God. We tell Him all the bad stuff. We, you know what you do? That's not humility. This is, this is despising what God has already done in your life. And, and the Lord spoke to me so clearly. He said, you mean to tell me, David? And I, he, There's no audible voice, but there's still a small voice. And he said, you want, are you telling me that after 50 years of preaching and all these books... And hundreds of thousands receiving your message around the world, that all of that was in vain? Are you telling me that every test and trial that you didn't learn anything about it? You're telling me what you forgot? And you're telling me that after all my whisperings of the Holy Ghost in your ear, after all my love to you, after all my pleadings with you, and all my mercy, that was all empty and in vain? God doesn't want to hear it. Go to the secret closet and begin to proclaim the victory of Jesus in your life. God has done a miracle for every one of us. God said, you haven't forgotten anything, David. When you need it, I'll remind you about it. I'll bring it out. It's all there. It's all locked up in here, but you'll have it when you need it. You haven't lost anything. Every day is a new day with a new beginning, with a new touch of the Holy Ghost. He said, take heed, Hebrew writer said, lest you fall in the same example as they fell. I don't know where to go now. Because God's still dealing with me. You've not passed this way before. It's something new God's wanting to do in our lives. I've not been this way before. Because I'm just learning at my age now. The blessed peace and rest that comes when you truly cast everything in His hand. And when you truly believe Him that He will see you through. Here's what they were told. And I'm going to close in just a moment. Be strong. Be very courageous. That you may observe to do according to 
all the law. Do not turn to the right or the left. That means from the word. That you may prosper wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart out of your mouth. Meditate in it day and night. Observe to do all that's written therein. And you shall have success. Have not I commanded you? I've commanded you to be strong. Have good courage. I've commanded you to be not afraid nor dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God says, I command you. Come into my presence as a king who's victorious. Come into my presence. Don't, don't look at the world situation. Don't look at militant homosexuality as if they're going to take over everything in society. That's a minority group. We pray for them. We despise the sin, but we love the sinner. But folks, I'm not, I'm not going to sit around worrying about gay marriage. God's more concerned about where you're going. He's more concerned about you being a testimony. God, one day, every, knee's bow, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. The Bible said all the nations in the world but are dropping a bucket to him. He raises up one and brings down another. But one of these days, the Bible said he's going to make them his footstool. Every other God shall kneel and bow. Every other religion shall kneel and bow. Every politician shall bow. Folks, it's true. God has everything under control in your life, in my life. It's not going to spin out of control. God's still the boss. I said God's still the boss. Let's stand. Oh, God. We have nothing to be afraid of. We have nothing to fear. Oh, God, take our eyes off of our weaknesses, off our failures, and let's behold Him, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, You said, don't bring to my altar anymore a lamb that is not right. Don't bring me a crippled offering. Don't bring any more into my house your doubts and your unbelief. Trust me. And I'll see you through. And I'll walk with you. Do you believe the Lord is in the house? Do you believe the Lord is with us? Yes, He is. I, I repeat the command of the Lord. Be strong. Be very courageous. Do not be afraid.